Okay, it's recording. Yeah, please uh, start. Yeah. Okay. All right. So yeah, it is great pleasure to talk here today about our recent work. Uh, so um, this is um, a piece of work that uh, focuses on the compilation of QLOA applications in quantum computing. So first, I'll talk a little bit about myself. Uh, so as Henry has introduced, so I work at the Rutgers University since 2012. I got my PhD from the College of William Mary in 2012. Uh, so I immediately started the Rutgers after that. And I worked at the, um, visited different places like Microsoft Research, PNNL, CWI at Amsterdam and so on. Um, so this is my email address and this is the best way to reach me. Um, my Gmail address is the best one. Um, I don't use my um, school email address a lot. So for, uh, for research, so the, the key um, thing on my research is that um, I develop compiler techniques for emerging computing architectures. So the emerging computing architectures uh, at their own times represent the best computation power that human beings can build. But programming these com emerging computing architectures is extremely challenging. We have to lift up the abstractions and let the users be able to take the, um, the full advantage of this, um, uh, of this uh, massive computation uh, engines. So I have worked on compil compil compilers for uh, different types of architectures. So in the earlier days, I worked on shared memory multiple processors. So that's around uh, 2007 uh, and, and until around 2012. And I worked on GPU accelerators between 2012 and 2019. And recently in the past four years, I have been working on quantum computing. So I worked on different aspects of quantum computing, uh, hardware mapping, scheduling, uh, for tolerance, scheduling for um, error corrected quantum hardware, pulse generation and et cetera. So beyond all of this, I'm also very interested in uh, the, theoret the theoretical models that we can apply to system work, like, such as uh, graph theoretical models, uh, graph partition, H partition, uh, path finding, A star models, and so on. All right, so, uh, so that's about me. Um, so today I'm going to talk about our recent paper. Uh, it's called uh, Exploiting the, re the Regular Structure of Modern Quantum Architectures for Compiling and Optimizing Programs with Permutable op Operators. So for this paper, so first I'll give you an introduction like about this problem and our inspirations uh, for solving this problem uh, and also for building an optimal solver. And then I'm going to show you some experiment results. Um, and in the end, if we have time, I'll also talk about the, the generic mapper we have, uh, my group has built uh, in the past, if we have time. Okay, so now we are in the um, so-called, what's so-called the NISC um, computing era, but also in the second uh, revolution of quantum computing. So the first revolution quantum computing is about the discoveries of the, um, the particles, uh, atoms, uh, molecules, subatoms, and et cetera. And the second wave of quantum revolution uh, is, is um, the advancement in the hardware algorithms and applications uh, that can help us uh, solve real world problems. And we are very fortunate to be on uh, this time that and we are starting to see uh, more and more NISC devices in a, at a very uh, fast speed. So now let's look at this uh, roadmap of IBM's quantum um, processors. So in 2019, IBM built Falcon series processors and they were able to build up to 27 qubit machine. And in 2020, they built Hummingbird with up to 65 qubits. And then uh, in 2021, they have this 127 Eagle, uh, Eagle, Eagle processors. And um, now the largest machine they have built is the Ospera processor with four, over 400 qubits. And 
if you look at the, the future, uh, so there's they're expected to build um, thousands of qubits uh, in the next two years. So as you can see that there's a, a exponential scaling of the number of qubits that the industry is able to build today, so which is very exciting that quantum computing is getting real. So now as this hardware is scaling up, we start to see regularity in the uh, hardware. So we see the regularity in the qubit connectivity. So for example, IBM has this heavy hex uh, architecture. So it's basically uh, you know, a set of connected heavy hexagons. And for Google, um, so they have this um, uh, sort of uh, rotated lattice architecture. So it's a regular 2D grid as if it is rotated and uh, it's amenable to surface code implementation for error correction. Okay, so you see this, um, so, so from, from my point of view, I think any kind of hardware that scales uh, has to be built on upon some kind of repeated, um, repetitive um, building blocks. Uh, so well before this, so in the earlier days, right? So in the earlier days, um, the hardware vendors, they, are, they undergo the experiment pro process of uh, different prototypes. So the compilers have to deal with this irregularity in the hardware. For example, they have to deal with different uh, connectivity architecture for superconducting qubits um, and et cetera. So, but now we're facing a new challenge. So the new challenge for compiler construction is that how do we cope with uh, regularity in today's hardware and also the hardware in the next two, two, 10 years or 20 years, and how do we maximize the potential of it? Okay, so this is the regularity challenge. So in this talk, I'm going to look at the specific type of application um, that will run on these regular architectures. So this application uh, is called the QLOA. Um, so it is a hybrid quantum classical parameterized algorithms uh, that can be used to solve combinatorial optimization problems. And this is a, a, a diagram I, I got, uh, I copied it from another paper that shows like perfectly the process. So we have the quantum hardware with parameterized um, ANSAS circuits. Um, and then we also have the classical components. So the, the parameters, um, so the quantum hardware runs these parameterized circuits, make measurements, and then uh, the classical optimizer will use methods, machine learning methods to um, calculate the gradients and update the parameters. And then these new parameters will be fed into the quantum hardware again. So compiler basically, you know, the, the compiler does work like in between. So it compiles the circuit if necessary, optimizes the circuit if necessary, um, and then let quantum hardware run it. So QLA represents the class of applications, uh, for example, the knapsack problem, traveling salesman problem, coloring problem, set problem, and et cetera. So I will be specifically looking at the max cut problem. Um, so the max cut problem is represent representative because it has these two local operations that also frequently emerge in Hamiltonian simulation. Okay, so now let's look at um, a QAOA circuit um, with a very simple example. So in this QAOA max cut, uh, circuit, we have an input problem graph. Um, so this is the graph we want to cut. So we want to find the max cut solution. And here we have the circuit. Okay, so in this circuit, um, so there is um, the problem Hamiltonian component, and there is also the mixing component. So in the problem, problem Hamiltonian component, uh, it corresponds to the input problem graph. So every qubit uh, exactly corresponds to one node in this uh, input graph. Um, every, every gate, every two qubit gate here corresponds to an edge uh, in this um, input problem graph. So for example, we have this um, gate G1 between zero and one, uh, gate G3 between uh, qubit one and two and, and so on. Okay, so this uh, the problem Hamiltonian circuit has to contain um, the two qubit gates that correspond to edges in the input graph. 
Um, so this gate, uh, it is worth noting that this gate has six control phase gates. So they're basically diagonal unitary matrices. And they, so because they're diagonal unitary matrices, so they can uh, run in any order uh, without changing the final outcome of the circuit. And also, it's worth noting that the direction really doesn't matter. The control target direction really doesn't matter because the phase will only be applied when both of them are one at once in the, uh, the corresponding basis state. Okay. Um, so because this gates commute, so uh, it turns out you can, you know, you can run them in any order. So this is a, again, example that you can move this gate um, G2 up to the front, uh, such that you only have like, now you only have a depth three, so three layers instead of four layers in the first uh, circuit constructed from this input input problem graph. So you can you can choose any circuit uh, as long as it has a set of uh, two qubit gates correspond to the ages. Okay, so that exposes um, more compilation opportunities. Okay, so now if we think about uh, how to map this circuit um, to the hardware, right? so now we're also facing different choices. Uh, so, so in, in the, the graphs in the bottom, this is a, let's say we have a, a hardware coupling graph, which is just the line. Um, and then we use this notation because control phase gates really doesn't matter which one is control, which one is target. So this is a new notation. So as you can see for, for this, this logical circuit, right? So, um, so one possible way to add swaps uh, is that you add swap between um, you know, Q1 and Q2 and Q3 and Q4. Okay, so in the parenthesis, it's a mapping from logic qubit to the physical qubit. So you see that after this swap, now for G4, uh, Q1 is mapped to P2 now and Q4 is mapped to, to P3 now. So G4 is executable and this one takes two, um, two swaps. So however, uh, if we look at the second circuit, which we move the gate G2 up to the front, um, and then, uh, so there exists a swap insertion method such that we just have to insert one swap between Q0 and Q4, and such that we will have a smaller depth of the entire circuit. So this example just shows that you know, there are opportunities to reorder the gates in the original circuit um, due to the cumulativity property. And these opportunities give rise to um, compiler optimizations. For example, compiler, compiler optimizations for reducing the gate count and uh, the depth of the circuit. Okay, so, so now I will talk about uh, our solutions. Um, and before I talk about our solutions for this QAOA mapper, um, so I want to um, like talk a little bit about the main inspirations. So first of all, um, the, the first implication is that if we can solve an uh, n-click QAOA circuit efficiently, then we can solve any sub-circuit of this click circuit efficiently. So by n-click uh, n -click QAOA circuit, um, that means the input problem graph is just a click, okay? Because any, any problem graph is just a sub-graph or, uh, uh, or a click graph. Um, so therefore, um, if we can solve this um, superset problem efficiently, then any sub problem would be just the instance like that's smaller than the super superset problem. Okay, so this is a number one uh, inspiration. And number two, um, so there used to be a famous permutation network result by Abraham Worksman in computer networking. So what it shows is that we can, you know, given um, a list of input nodes, uh, we can do nearest neighbor exchanges using binary cells. So binary exchange cells, uh, in a uh, weekend such that we can achieve a uh, permutation in linear time, any permutation in linear time. Okay, but this is just for one permutation. So um, it's somehow is related to our work, uh, but it's not, a, it's not exactly the same because they're looking at the linear um, arrangement of the inputs and the exchange, um, binary exchange networks. 
but we suspect that you know there might be some similar result for QoS mapping of the click circuit uh, into a regular quantum hardware uh, that's also potentially not linear but multi-dimensional. And the third inspiration is that um, so if you know there exists a structured solution for this kind of problems, just like a um, Waxman's Walk, permutation network. Um, you know, the pattern will emerge even when we have very small input, right? And if we find such pattern, we can generalize it to larger inputs. Um, but so the condition is that we have to be able to find solutions to this like small instances of this problem. Um, but they shouldn't be too small. They should also be large enough that we can generalize such a structured solution, uh, a generalizable solution. Okay, so this is the third inspiration. So based on this inspiration, uh, we designed an optimal solver based on the A star paradigm uh, that can find solutions for reasonably sized circuits. And then that basically constitutes the foundation of this work. Um, so before talking about this optimal solver, uh, I want to talk about you know, what we have found using the solver uh, to motivate it. Okay, so I will start with uh, multiple um, you know, scenarios. Um, the first scenario uh, is the linear architecture. So in the linear architecture, so again, now we assume that the input is a click graph, okay? So it's so the problem graph is all to all connected. So it's not interesting in the real, you know, in the real problem setting because max cut for a click graph uh, is not that interesting. But because it's a super, you know, it, it's a so any graph is a subset of that. So that makes it that's why you know it's interesting. So let's say we have a linear architecture. So again, in this linear architecture. Uh, the qubits are arranged as if they were on a line. And then this is the solution we have found. Okay, so this is the circuit, the circuit solution uh, for mapping a click circuit, a, a, a click input problem graph into a linear architecture. So for you can see that it shows a, like a very nice and generalizable pattern with just the six qubits. So I will describe this, uh, this, this uh, diagram. So here, every you know, this is a, um, a C phase gate re represents a C phase gate, and this this uh, represents the exchanges, so swaps. Okay, um, and you see that we can have you know we can have this C phase gates running in parallel, almost uh, making the entire set of qubits, all of them, active, um, and then followed by you know adjacent uh, swap pairs uh, starting from you know, different odd or even indices, starting from e either index zero, or starting from index one, but there, there are um, consecutive uh, swap uh, steps. Okay, and in between, every two layers of sw uh, like uh, uh, alternating swap swap layers, you, we actually run this uh, C phase case like immediately on, uh, on the qubit that just has performed the swap case. Actually, you can switch, you can change the order. It really doesn't matter. But the key here really is that you know we just have to double the depth of the circuit uh, in order to be able to run all the gates in this um, and and click circuit. Okay, so that is like this is a pretty cool, I think. Um, so this is like so number one. So this is what we have like the conclusion we have drawn from this. Um, have automating swap and computation layers. Um, and then the swap layers are also performing uh, adjacent uh, pairs of swaps and the computation layer performing adjacent pairs of uh, computational gates. So number two, what we can find from here is that, you know, if you repeat uh, this swapping layers enough number of times, you will see that uh, the mapping of the qubits actually are reversed. So as if they're measured on this um, linear architecture. So now Q0 goes here, Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q5, okay? Well, for, for just completing these gates, uh, the computer, the C phase gates really doesn't matter if we insert the last two layers, those swaps or not. But it's just interesting, you know, to see this result, you know, if we ever want to reverse this uh, qubit arrangements, um, 
you can just uh, you know add to like you know repeat this pattern um for like another two layers and then that will be done so this would might be helpful in the few you know in the next uh, few uh in, in the future in next few slides and also maybe our future work right so if we want to mirror the qubits back okay so now if we uh look at this um this computation pattern so like in the first layer you would uh, you know, finish this gates in the graph and then in the second layer you, you add more and more gates to that and so on okay so this is um um well this basically later on would be might be useful when we try to pick you know the initial mapping uh, for the sparser graphs that's not a click okay so the take the two key points here are you know this one the alternating pattern and second the mirroring of the qubits. Okay, so so this this result actually was uh, also found by uh, physicists in uh, one a previous paper on in physical review letters PRL I think in two thousand uh, I don't remember uh, two thousand seventeen. Um, so they find this pattern manually. Um, or for mionic swap networks, which is very cool, but you know, but we we just want to demonstrate that here. This is found automatically, uh, not manually, um, by genius physicist. Okay, so but a lot of architectures are actually not uh, linear line architectures, right? So, um, for example, we could have this uh, two dimensional uh, grid, um, and in the future we might even have three dimensional architectures. So how do we handle uh, this kind of multi-dimensional architectures? So then we propose this divide and conquer approach. Uh, so we divide the qubits into units, right? So for example, for this 2D grid, you can divide it into multiple rows. Um, and then for this three-dimensional architecture, you can divide it into multiple plans. And each plan is divided into multiple rows and so on. So you can keep doing this. So, so once we have all these units, um, so we can do this recursively. So we can ensure auto-to-all -all interaction within each unit. And then we can ensure bipartite auto-to-all interactions between every two units. And that will still guarantee auto-to-all -all interaction between these all qubits, okay? So that's the key idea. That's really the key idea uh, for us uh, to be able to find the solution for the 2D grid and also for Google Sigma and et cetera. And also potential future application and future hardware. Okay, so let's turn this into a concrete example. Um, this divide and conquer method. So let's say we have this 2D grid, okay, and then we're going to divide them into rows. Each row is a unit, and we name them as U0, U1, U2, U3. Okay, so now um, so we're going to mimic the behavior of the linear architecture. Okay, because now it is as if these four units are linearly connected. And so if we want to swap them, you know, swap the, as if we're swapping the two individual nodes, um, we can do this, uh, you know, in a parallel swap operation. Okay, so with this uh, one layer of parallel swap operations, we'll be able to exchange two rows. So we call it a two X unit exchange uh, to distinguish it from the single swaps. Okay, so now, uh, so we can just uh, you know apply the same um, movement pattern in the linear architecture uh, for u0, u1, u2, u3. Okay, so these five steps are basically mimicking what's happening in the linear architecture. So you perform alternating, um, you know, like the the, the alternating swaps um, starting from either zero uh, index physical index zero physical index one, and eventually you'll be able to reverse all of them. And in the meantime. Uh, you will be able to uh, have one every uh, unit be neighbor to the other unit, right? So, if we look at this um, concrete example here, um, u zero, you know, becomes neighbor with u one here, u three here, u two here, right? Um, so it's one, two, three. So it's all, all already enough. What the the other moments are for the other, you know, for the other units like u one is neighbor to uh, also U0 here, well, it happens to be U2 and then U3, uh, and U1 is neighbor to U3 here, um, and U1 is neighbor to U2 here, right? So then we can also 
perform the you know as if work perform for performing this computation operations between neighboring units. So so by doing so, we can make every unit be the neighbor nearest neighbor every other node uh, in this architecture. Okay, so this question, this problem is solved, but then there is more problem. So the, the next problem is how do we do this in the unit uh, computation, right? So previously in the linear architecture, uh, between two nodes, that's simple, it's just a C phase gate. So now if we want to do a C phase gate between two units, and that's a little bit trickier. Um, uh, but we were lucky enough, we find such solution uh, using the A star solver. Uh, which I'll talk about later today. Okay, so again, so it, it turns out it, you know, it's, uh, it capitalize, uh, catalyzes into a very beautiful pattern again uh, to make the, you know, the, un the top unit that interact with the bottom unit in by pi tight auto manner. So what you need to do is you're going to apply this, uh, again, alternating swaps um, starting from either zero location zero or location one. Okay, that's the one step. And then you perform, you put, you do the same, but it just like change the starting index for the top row and the bottom row. So by doing this multiple times, um, what happens is that you will make sure every node on the top row will be neighbor to every node in the bottom row in the vertical links. Okay, and then again, this is done in linear time. So it's, um, it's a factor O and if, um, N is the number of elements in uh, the top row or the bottom row. So can, we can look at this concrete example to quickly validate this. Okay, so you see that we're doing this um, uh, alternating swaps um, in step B and D. Okay, so, and then after that, uh, so if we look at the, you know, the location OA0, um, it's neighbor to B0, B2, B1. Okay, so it will finish interaction with all the items in, in the column in the row B. And similar, so if you look at the other uh, nodes, it will be exactly the same. Okay, so for this one, uh, we didn't like to add additional swaps to mirror them back, but if you add one more, um, you know, one more layer of swap between A1 and A2, um, B0 and B1. So again, it's going to mirror, it's going to mirror the elements on the top row and the elements of this bottom row uh, such that their uh, arrangement is isomorphic to where they were before. Okay. Okay, so we solved the interunit um, by pi height auto interaction. So the next thing is uh, intra-unit um, auto or interaction. So, because each unit is just a row, and then in, in this row, uh, the, un the nodes are arranged as if they're, it's on a linear line, so we can just uh, directly use uh, um, the idea. You now we find um, the solution find for the linear architecture. Okay, so with all of that, the problem is solved. So there are a few manual optimizations we applied to this 2D grid. Because you might be wondering, you know, for the 2D grid, we can connect a line or all the nodes, right? So why don't we just do that? But the, the, so one of the answers is that, you know, so it will, so when we use, we have more connectivity, actually we can do better than just connecting this linear line. So this is one of the answer to that. Uh, and then the other possible answer is that, you know, in the future, you might be seeing architecture, you cannot connect the line. Um, Right, so you cannot find, a, a, I think, a Hilbert or path for connecting all the nodes in the graph. So that's not guaranteed. So a scalable approach that can be recursively broken down into smaller steps is actually very valuable. Okay, so this is it for the uh, 2D grid case. So I just want to, you know, talk about the key takeaway messages here, as we all have already seen an example of this divide and conquer approach. Uh, so, so there are like four things we have to do, right? So first we have to have this define the units, unit exchange, and we have to make sure every unit gets to be the nearest neighbor or every other unit at least once. And then we have to do this inter-unit bipartite or, or interaction, intra-unit bipartite interaction. So it's usually more challenging um, to find this interunit bipartite or to all interaction 
pattern or solution like, according to our experience. Um, dividing units and you know make it be nearest neighbor area otherwise is usually not that challenging. So we use the A star solver to find these patterns uh, in this work. So there could also be other solvers, of course, like um, set solvers in the future. Uh, so this could be our future work. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about uh, our um, discovery for the Google Sigma, this uh, rotated lattice architecture. So again, I will start with a unit and the unit exchanges. So a unit, as you can see, is you know it's just as if it's a virtual row here in this rotated lattice. Um, and then for unit exchange, so we can utilize the links, um, this pairwise links between these two units in this architecture. So unit exchange now is also easy. So we can arrange them, uh, arrange the units as if they're on a linear line, okay, and exchange between them as these parallel swaps. Okay, um, so, so the next question now uh, is how do we do this inter-unit bipartite? Uh, interactions, right? So for 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 this particular case, uh, we find out that you need a series of three swaps in order to switch the locations of um, two qubits on the on, on the same row. Every two qubits arrange the consecutive way on the same row. So to explain this, so let me uh, use this concrete example. Okay, so this is a Google vertical um, Sigma architecture, but we somehow adjusted the uh, location when we draw it. Um, so let's say I want to switch the location A2 and A1, right? So A1 and A2 here, they're not, there's no direct link between them, but there is a bridge, uh, you know, there's a, a router somehow in between them. If B1 is a router. So what happens here is we do a um, swap between A1 and B1, and A1 goes here, and we do another swap uh, and the A1 goes here, but then we have to put, you know, B1 back and also uh, A1, uh, A, right? So A1 to the top row. So then you just insert another swap, okay? So it's a swap in the same location and then two swaps in the same location and one swap and on the diagonal. So with that, you can see the location of A1 and A2 uh, uh, are exchanged. So A2 goes first and A1 goes second. Right, so you can do this for A3 and A4 um, similarly. So you do this, uh, this two swaps and this diagonal swap, right? So which is cap uh, captured in this image. Um, so what is uh, a little bit, uh, you know, subtle here uh, is that, so like if you just want to exchange location A1, A2, A3, A4, you don't really need this, 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 this swap. Okay, so we, we just happen to find out you know, if you if we if we want to swap B two and B three, you just have to add a you know an additional swap that can be parallelized to these diagonal ones, and then you can achieve um, the you know the, the virtual swaps for the bottom row by starting a different uh, physical index in the same way. So this is very cool. So but but the idea I think can be easily summarized from this figure here, right? So if you want to exchange location B2, B3, you do this uh, uh, B, B2, B3 swap, and then you, you three will go here, right? Um, and then the last swap will be a B2, um, so it goes B2 will go here. So it, it's basically they're sharing, uh, you know, these two vertical swaps uh, for exchange locations on the top row and exchange location in the second row. It just happens to work out, okay? So remember I talked about it earlier. So if you have a, you know, two X uh, N architecture, you just have to, you know, exchange the location, top row, bottom row in an alternating way. And then you will be able to make one, uh, every node neighbor to every node in, in, in one row and every node, every, other, every node in the other row at least once. Okay, so you just have to ensure this automating pattern is happening here because we already have this vertical links for computation interaction. So this is perfectly realized that, um, but compared with the 2D grid, it's going to be done in a little bit more time. Uh, it needs three parallel swap layers and this one just needs one parallel swap layer. Um, so there will be take, taking a little bit more time, but that's because again, for this architecture, 
Sigma architecture, it's difficult to find a line that will connect the every every nodes in. It can be proved that actually there's no single line that will connect every node here, so it's impossible to achieve this linear uh, linear complexity. I mean, well, they're both still linear complexity, but not the same factor in front of the uh, n, which n is the total number of of the nodes. Okay. Okay. So yeah. So so this is a discovery for. Um, for the Google SQL architecture, I'll talk a little bit uh, about uh, heavy hex uh, later. Um, but before that, I want to talk a little bit about our optimal solver and how uh, that is designed. The solver is open source for the uh, QLOA mapper. Um, so we basically design a search tree um, based on the state of the circuit. So we we divide the circuits execution into multiple cycles and each cycle is one state. So for example, for B here, uh, we have uh, this qubits and we have five uh, cycles. So this represents this five nodes in this uh, search tree. So when you advance to the next node, you're, advanced, you're advancing one cycle. And then one cycle in the state of one cycle, it captures uh, the you know the gates that's being performed and the mapping of the logic qubits to the physical qubits and etc. Right, so then you can imagine, uh, given any node, given any current state, and all its of course all its precedent states, you can make different choices. Right, when you advance to the next cycle, you can choose like which combination of gates to execute, or maybe no gate at all, only only swaps. Right. So you can enumerate all these possible choices and branch out from one node, um, have multiple children nodes, and that will capture the entire search space. Um, and so then we define this root node. So the root node is like a, nothing has been processed. And we define the terminal node. So the terminal node is marked to the end of the processing of the circuit. So all gates have been processed, okay? Um, so so therefore, once we have constructed the search, search tree, and then we will be able to apply this A star uh, algorithm paradigm as long as we can define a good cost of function. So a good cost of function that ensures the optimality is a cost function that is admissible. So next I'll talk about this cost of function. Okay, so in the cost of function, uh, so it, it basically says, um, you know, if I start from the root node and I'm going to going down to some terminal nodes via this node V, uh, what is the, uh, you know, the possible number of cycles that it will take. And this number of cycles has to be smaller than the optimal number of cycles, okay, for any path that go, going through that point. So, so CV is a part, FV equals CV plus HV. CV is the cost of reaching the node from the root. So this is easy, just calculating the number of ages from the root to the node. Um, HV is actually the part from this node to any, any um, terminal node, right? What's minimal way to reach a terminal node. So, in I, so we, what we do is we look at the every gate um, and then we look at the qubits on every two qubit gate. Okay, so it has, it's called QI and QJ. So in the ideal case, so if we have all to all hardware, connection hardware, like in the trapped ion machines, um, you just you just take the degree of this two um, two qubits in this uh, input problem graph, and you take the maximum one of that. Right, so that's the minimum, and then you take the well, and then you for for all Q, for all such cases take the maximum of that. So then that's going to be uh, the minimal depth of the circuit. Right, so this is the this is admissible, definitely. Way. But we also want to now if we look, we're looking at this uh, non-perfect, like non all to all connected hardware. So then now the distance between these two qubits in this gate, uh, so it may not be one. Uh, so let's assume it is D, right? So in total, we have to do at least D minus one swaps. It could be QI moves some steps, QJ moves some steps, but in total, when we sum them up, it has to be at least D minus one. And then here comes our cost function for HV. Um, well, so this so will break down the HV function. So for this real cost function, so what we do is 
we uh, we're going to divide this d minus one steps into two parts. So one qubit moves like x, and the other qubit moves the d minus one minus x steps. And we're going to take the minimal of that. Okay. The the minimal of that for this the x values between zero and d minus one. And then we'll look at all gates, all remaining gates that haven't been processed, and then we we'll take the maximum of that for um, real g g for the remaining gates. So again, this function now takes into consideration uh, all of the of the swaps that we have to to apply. Um, so it's better than this ideal cost function. Okay, so it is just that simple. Um, you know, with this cost function, at least for now, for the scale of the problem we're looking at now to let such a pattern, uh, solution pattern emerge, this is actually good enough. Okay, so then, we, so we, this is the, our cost function. This is how we uh, find the solutions for the linear pattern. And then this like the bipartite all to all for the two X, two times D, uh, two row interaction pattern in the grid. And also we find more, even more um, bipartite auto interaction for the Google Sigma, which is not presented here. So I will, uh, if you're interested, you can look at our paper for more details. Okay, so before talking about the experiments, I will uh, talk a little bit about heavy hex, IBM heavy hex architecture. So, so this one is actually an adaptation of the linear pattern. Okay, so we're being creative here. Not everything is solved by the linear pattern. Um, so we adapted them in somehow uh, um, for this like a little bit more complex architectures. So for the IBM heavy hex architecture, we define it in a way that will have a path, uh, a snake that connects this, um, you know, the the qubits um, of this heavy hexagon building blocks. Okay, so this is a, like a predefined path. So we call it, you know, all. So, so, so we can do all to all interaction for the nodes on this snake. Um, and then for, so there are other two types of nodes, right? So let's look at the gray nodes. So the gray nodes are in between like two segments of the, of the snake path. Um, so then next we're going to do the swap just using one um, swap layer, parallel swap layer. So we're going to move this uh, gray nodes up to the main path. And then we can perform uh, the main, again, all to all uh, for interaction for this main path. And then uh, in the middle, we also let this, all, um, we call it on path nodes and off path nodes interaction if, you know, whenever possible. So that will guarantee, again, all to all interaction between all nodes, like this on path nodes, off path nodes, this gray nodes and yellow nodes. Um, so there's a rigorous proof for that. So I will refrain from talking about too much of that today because of lack of time. Okay, now um, I will talk about, you know, the, the more practical question, right? So previously I talked about, um, you know, the input circuit is actually a click, but in reality, the input circuit is never a click. Okay, so how do we adapt our all to all solutions to the non-click uh, non uh, cases? So we have, um, you know, we have this idea of combining the greedy solution with the ATA pattern solution, because, you know, when we have sparse graphs, you probably don't want to follow the ATA pattern exactly. It's, it's going, they're going to be a lot of idle qubits, okay? So, but, you know, but on the other hand, so if you have the initial mapping, um, you can actually predict if you use this ATA pattern, um, how many cycles it will take. You know, we follow the ATA pattern because the Eric circuit is just a subset of this click, right? So you follow the ATA pattern, you skip whatever case that did not appear in the original graph. Um, and then you stop at the earliest time when you have finished all the gates. And then you can predict how long it's gonna take. So, so we're going to do a greedy scheduling um, for this entire circuit. But at every time, at every cycle, uh, we would stop and then we look at the current mapping and remaining gates and calculate, you know, what it would look like, how many how many gates and the swaps are needed, how, how much depth the circuit will take if we just follow the ATA pattern for now. Right. So then we keep many versions. So as we are scheduling a greedy we're keep, keeping many versions of the as if we're keeping many versions of the compiled circuit. 
And then in the end, so after the whole circuit is processed by the greedy approach, we're going to pick the best one among them all. So when we pick the best one, we consider multiple factors, like right? not just gate count fidelity, we also consider fidelity using fidelity metrics, such as um, uh, estimated the success probability, the mapping of qubits into uh, you know, variable with, with variable uh, error rates, okay? So we call this a method that takes the best of the both words, because it could be, you know, that when the graph is very sparse, you don't directly follow the ATA pattern, you just use a greedy solution. You know, it's even better than linear. The solution would be even better than linear. Um, but it could also be sometimes when the graph is denser, uh, the greedy solution will actually not help. So I will show an experiment result uh, in one of the future slides. So it's not going to help at all because it doesn't have any bound. The heuristic solution never provides any bound and sometimes it could be counteracting uh, its this, this own actions and actually make it worse, right? So, so with this approach, we can actually guarantee the linear bound and also make it not to, to like, uh, uh, like to, like rigidly follow the pattern, you know, without taking advantage of sparsity. Okay, so I think I used quite a lot of time. Uh, so I'll talk about the experiment. Um, so we have performed experiments on IBM Heavy Hex and this Google Rotated Lattice architecture. And we use the metrics of circuit depth, gate count, and the total variance distance. And we have multiple baselines, the polyhedral compiler, QAIM, and the toucan compiler. And we use the two types of graphs, random graphs and regular graphs, generated by the Python library network X. And then we scale up the uh, vertex number to 1024. Okay, so now let's look first look at the result uh, for IBM heavy hex architecture. So here we just show the depth and gate count, gate count because um, you know, fidelity number will be extremely small. In this case, that wouldn't make any sense. So this uh, white bars are our approach. So you can see that it actually it's quite it's doing quite well in, in terms of the in terms of the depths. Okay, compared with the other two approaches, um, for both random graphs and uh, regular graphs, and for gate count, uh, there's still an advantage. Although the reduction of gate count is not as significant as the uh, reduction for um, for the depths, okay? So, so, you know, so this is also, you know, something worth mentioning um, based on our, our observations, Like right? You can like reduce a, a certain number of gate counts, but probably not that significant, but you can reduce the depths, the, the duration, the, the reflection, a reflector of the duration of the circuit, which is very nice because, uh, because of the decoherence errors and et cetera. Um, okay, and then this is the result for Google Sycamore. Um, so similarly, we have this, um, you know, the result of, um, so ours shows much better, in, like a lot of, a lot of improvement. There's a more structured method on this regular architecture is more, much more improvement compared with the other two methods. And similar observation here, depth is in, in, much more significantly than the gate count. Uh, by the way, for gate count, so, so we are using a uh, log, uh, log scale. Uh, so it, it, there is a, but it's still like moderate uh, improvement for the gate count. So now we, we also compare with toucan because for toucan, toucan has two versions. So one version, they will, it's, it's, it's very, you know, a lot better than the other one when they determine the initial mapping using a quadratic complexity method. It doesn't run for very large inputs, so we have to compare with two can in a different using a different table. Um, well, so we also put the, the QI, QAIM result here. QAIM is a heuristic approach to early heuristic approach. So two can is better than QAIM um, in a lot of cases, um, gate count and also depths. But the hours again is like. It's typically much better than better than both cases um, for in terms of this um, two metrics. Okay, so because it's a QLA for max cut, so we run 
experiments on real uh, real mission. Um, so this shows the uh, we use the Coppola optimizer, and this shows uh, uh, the the mean uh, ground state energy how it evolves from different QAOA runs. Um, so I, I think this is a very small benchmark. I don't remember the number of qubits. I, I think I have, but it's relatively small. Um, but you can still see that you know it converges faster, and it also our approach will help obtain better ground state energy um, by significantly reduce the depth of the circuit and gate count. Okay, and this is a compilation time. So we show, you know, how, how much time it takes to compile different size. So the, um, the QA OS circuit up to 1024 uh, qubits. And last but not the least, so this is an experiment shows that shows our taking the best of both worlds approach. So we have this pure greedy approach, uh, which is this the blue bars. And we also have the pure ATA solver approach. So pure ATA just means from the very beginning, you're just going to pick an initial mapping and follow the entire pattern. And then our mixed solution is the one I talked about earlier. So we keep many versions as we're doing the greedy solution and pick the best one. So, so previously we thought, you know, maybe we'll take, you know, get a better of this too. But surprisingly, when we look at the experiment numbers, so this mix of solution is actually better than both of them. You know, I think in most of the cases, it's not just picking the best out of these two, but sometimes it's even better than the, the best of these two approaches. So which is quite surprising. So I think this demonstrates the strength of the methods that, you know, have you know that you know that have some kind of structure and also provides um, uh, linear you know the bound the like linear bound with a certain factor. Okay, so I think we need more and more structured methods for this kind of problems in the regular hardware in the future. I believe this is important uh, direction. Okay, so now let's conclude. So, um, so for this for this paper I presented today. Um, so first, um, the idea is that we solve an unclick circuit efficiently. Okay, so we, we discuss how to find solution for such an unclick circuit. Um, so we find a linear depth solution um, for this unclick circuit. And then this is somehow similar to the linear uh, famous solution by Abraham Worksman in, computation net in computer networking, uh, which is very cool. Um, and we designed so to to achieve such result with design optimal solver um, that can help us find solution with reasonable size circuit um, and it's you know it, it works because the size is not that large the optimal solver would work or if it's too large the optimal solver wouldn't work but it's also not too small because it can help us identify the potential recurring patterns that lead to a generalizable solution. And in the end, we design um, a heuristic you know, a method taking the best of both words method that will uh, help us uh, do it well uh, in the practical cases, not just the auto um, click cases. So with that, it brings me to the end of the talk. And uh, I'm sorry for taking so much time and I'll be happy to take any questions. <laughs>